Welcome to the show. I'm Chris Slater, retired F-16 pilot. You know, this is a, this is a difficult topic. I, I love some of the comments saying um, I should stay in my lane, right? As a, as a fighter pilot, I should stay in my lane and go back to UFOs as if UFOs are somehow in the lane of being a fighter pilot, right? You, you know how many fighter pilots are actually YouTubing about UFOs? There's There's one. Okay, I'm the only one. Okay, Ryan Graves used to do it, but uh, for five months he hasn't posted any videos. So UFOs are definitely a stigmatized topic, and so is this. Okay, if you say anything about uh, the universe is not expanding, or if you say uh, the Big Bang didn't happen, I've received multiple comments to again go back in my lane, right? Go back in my lane to UFOs, which again is not mainstream. If I cared about the clicks, then I would probably have sponsors, and I'd probably just make videos about planes and flying. Like I'd be videoing about the war in Israel, the drone strikes, because I do know all that stuff, but I'm not, right? I think war is stupid. I don't want to make videos about that. So I do this because I want to find the truth. I want to find the truth. And these are difficult topics. And so it's difficult to publish. So if, you, if you're still watching at this point, thank you so much, because I hope you can try and open your mind to new ideas because cosmology is, is obviously stuck. There's a huge stigma on it, just like with UFOs, UAPs, and aliens. You're not going to get scientific funding to go look for aliens. I just talked to Magnus Holm. He's the tech director up at Hestalen, and they cannot get any sort of interest from local academia there, again, because of the stigma. And the same thing is in mainstream science on cosmology. So it's difficult to publish on this topic, but I found an amazing channel Chris Brown, he's been looking into this for 12 years and he has the math to back it up. And so I'm very excited to have Chris Brown on the show to just go through quickly his idea on this topic. And really the main idea is that all cosmological redshift is gravitational redshift. That's that's really all it comes down to. It's a, it's a simple concept. So thank you for being here. Please smash the like button if you do like this content and subscribe for future notifications of my videos. Let's get to the show. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. So you've been looking into this singular topic uh, for the past 12 years. And what's been your experience with it? Oh, it's absurd. <laughs> uh, I highly recommend people avoid the topic as much as possible because once you start going down it, like it's, uh, it's definitely a never-ending rabbit hole. There's lots of discoveries to be made. Uh, What's your take on cosmology, the state of cosmology as it is now? I mean, the 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 term Lambda CDM, just the entire idea behind the expanding cold, dark matter, accelerating expansion, all of those things are mysteries, okay? They're not solutions. So like there's a, a obviously something either wrong or unknown. And I think that it's, you know, like when when something stinks, you, you might want to check your boots. Yeah. Look back at general assumptions, fundamental assumptions. You know, for decades we've been hearing about dark matter and they keep looking at for it. They keep making these huge, very expensive experiments. And they still haven't found anything. And we have people, astrophysicists like Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's famous actually, the UAP community, for again discounting it, not even considering that there could be aliens here. You know, it's just such a such a ridiculous concept. So what is their reception? A general astrophysicist or cosmology reception that all cosmological redshift is gravitational redshift. You know, why can they just not accept that or or look into it more? You know, I can't I can't really answer for them. I, for one, it's a complicated thing. For two, there's a a lot of minds that have went into into the current paradigm. And so no one person thinks that they're, you know, better than the collective. All of especially in physics and cosmology, because it's such a complicated arena Then I think that that probably has something to do with it. But with all of science, it just takes time. I think that, you know, I want to remain positive. I, 
in the past I've, I've said some negative things and I, I don't think it's helpful because honestly, everybody's trying to do a really good job. So it's, but it, it is extremely frustrating that it's, that there's hardly anything published on it yeah. because I know that the conversations happen behind closed doors. So I don't know why it's not more public. That, that would be my, my biggest discouragement with it is that this should be a public conversation. The expanding universe is nothing compared to Darwinian evolution. You know, if you doubt in Darwinian evolution, I like to, I'm not disrespecting you or anything like that. That's, that's fine, but you can have your opinions on those things, but it's going to be difficult scientifically to disprove Darwinian evolution, or at least just the general idea of, of evolution not even necessarily darwinian but my point is that it's it's a good paradigm and it's a it's a solid scientific paradigm to at least you you have to address that within cosmology the expanding paradigm is way more brittle than anything compared to something like that like uh it's nothing compared to say plate tectonics you know that's another theory we don't necessarily know if that's true or not but it, it's pretty it's on pretty solid foundation it's it's going to be difficult to re- to get rid of that from science, but within cosmology, the Lambda paradigm is not this sturdy in this, you know, like impossible to disprove theory. Like it's, it's a very weak, weak idea. All of the Lambda CDM paradigm, it's crumbling. Like nobody believes it. It's just difficult. And so like, that's what I wish is that there was more admission of that weakness. You know, I've read a lot of papers. I was just reading one yesterday. Uh, from an astrophysicist saying that uh, the surface brightness, it was related to the surface brightness argument from from Eric Lerner. Uh, and he said it it looked correct. And so it looked very difficult and I guess bad for the Big Bang essentially, but they didn't have a better model. There was nothing really to go back and look at as a better model. So they just keep going with the Big Bang. Like they just keep going with Lambda CDM, the cold dark matter, even though we can't find dark matter, and even though dark energy is still this enigma, this mystery, they have nothing better. Um, so I just wanted to show that you do have an argument. You know, you do have an argument, and we're going to show the math here, and we're going to keep it as simple as possible so people can follow along and just show that it could be just gravitational redshift. So I just want to talk through what is gravitational redshift, right? Okay, and this, okay. this is from ChatGBT. Gravitational redshift is a phenomenon predicted by Einstein's theory of re- relativity, general, general relativity. It occurs when light or other electromagnetic ra- radiation from an object is increased in wavelength or redshifted. So its frequency will actually be moved towards the red end of the spectrum as it escapes from a region of stronger gravitational field. Here are some of the best examples and experiments that have measured gravitational redshift. So we have the pound Rebka experiment, 1959 to 1959. 60. This is one of the earliest and most direct tests of gravitational redshift. It was conducted at Harvard University. The experiment measured the redshift of gamma rays emitted from the top of a tower and absorbed at the bottom, confirming Einstein's prediction of gravitational redshift with high precision. So this is measured on Earth. So we know gravitational redshift happens on Earth. Then the second one's the gravity probe A. That was in 1976. It was a satellite-based experiment involved a hydrogen maser clock placed in a rocket. It was launched to an altitude of about 10,000 kilometers, and it measured the frequency shift of the signals sent from the maser as they moved through Earth's gravitational field. Then we see another, this is a white dwarf observation. So again, astronomers use uh, gravitational redshift all the time. The white dwarf observations, the intense gravitational fields of white dwarfs provides an environment where, where gravitational redshift can be observed. So spectroscopic observations of light emitted from these stars. So each of the little elements, they can tell spectrographically where it moves. have shown shifts consistent with general relativity. Then you have galactic center observations. Okay, so observations of stars orbiting the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. They also provide a measured gravitational redshift again. So we measure this redshift and GPS. So although primarily a practical application rather than an experiment, the operation of GPS satellites provides a real-world example of gravitational redshift. So the atomic clocks aboard GPS satellites run faster than identical clocks on Earth's surface due to weaker gravitational field at that altitude. So this is directly related to 
redshift. I just want to show gravitational redshift is a measured thing, with, and they use it all the time in astronomy. Each of these examples has played a crucial role in testing and confirming the predictions of general relativity concerning the influence of gravity on the propagation of light and electromagnetic radiation. So we know gravitational redshift exists, right? We don't know dark matter exists. We've never measured it. We don't know expanding space actually exists. We've never measured it. Um, we don't know dark energy actually exists, right? We haven't directly measured it, but we have measured gravitational redshift, right? I guess from your argument, what I understand watching all of your uh, amazing videos, at the beginning, you were, you, you were gung-ho. I, I could tell you did tons of editing. And then as it went along, I could see you were just like beaten down uh, over, over the years. I don't know if it's through comments or whatever that people just didn't get the idea. But basically the way I understand it, and, and then I'll give you the floor, um, is that gravity has no distance limit, right? So as light spreads, as it propagates from a source, like a distant galaxy, as it propagates, as it, as it gets further away from that source, all of the matter within that light field, all of the matter is going to pull. It's going to have some gravitational effect on the light. And like I just showed, proven through many times, it's going to redshift. So I've heard this in the past as tired light. Okay, But I, I just want to say tired light, what they say, that, and they just discounted immediately, is that it actually, it would be scattering. We should see blurry light, right? But if we look at these distant galaxies and we look at those stars, that white dwarf star I just mentioned, it's not blurry. So with gravitational redshift, it's not a blurry image. We still get a clear image. So from, from what I understand is, as we look at larger and larger object of space, volume of space, it actually will be redshifted more. So th that's how I understand uh, your basic argument. Is that yeah, that's, that's exactly right. If you just have two objects, an observer and an emitter, like the simplest possible thing, the mass of the emitter plays a role and there's going to be a redshift if it's more massive than the observer. So the light is traveling uphill. Well, if you just add a cloud, does that increase the redshift or, or decrease the redshift? Why would it decrease the redshift? The mass is increasing. And so once you have the cloud, to know the total mass, you have to include the other stuff. And yeah, so whatever the, the, you're looking at, yeah. The, the radius. I, I think of it also like uh, the moon is pulling its gravity on us, right? The moon is obviously pulling. It pulls the tides. So the moon is affecting us. The sun is, is obviously pulling gravity on us, right? Yes. Mars actually affects Earth. I saw a, a recent article where Mars, every 2.4 million years, based on the orbits, would actually affect plate tectonics on Earth. Yeah. And as you get outside the solar system now, now everything inside the solar system is going to pull. It's going to pull on that light, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. as you get larger, as you look at the galaxy now, everything inside that galaxy now is going to affect the, the light. And it's just how you actually observe it because you can just keep expanding out, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the volume of space gets larger and larger as the light travels further, which means there's more mass in that volume of space. And more you know, mass to affect the light. Yep. Right. And that's that, that's the simple argument for why there's gravitational redshift, but there's much stronger arguments, you know, like the Schwarzschild metric. And I would refer to people to my website for they could read about the more complicated areas of it. But it's uh it's a very simple thing though. There's two options for redshifting light. You have motion or gravitational redshift well with starlight it's redshifted according to the distance it is from us and by and so, motion you mean the doppler right so basically you have right. a, it's just the doppler effect yes redshift that i was that that i've already described where it's actually the effect of gravity at redshift's light that that uh, i showed many examples of and then mm -hmm. you mentioned motion which will be the doppler effect that people are used to of a train right as it's mm -hmm. moving Right. Like if it's moving away from you, then it, it would be redshifted. But the weird thing about our universe is that the redshift is proportional to the distance from us. So the further away it is, the faster it's moving. But that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because the well, the, However, all of our measurements come from redshift, right? Right. Sure. They have an explanation. The explanation is that space is expanding. Oh, but with the other one, the gravitational redshift, that's the other option. 
the further away it is, the more mass there is. The more mass that we talked about to affect it. The right. more mass between us and the light. That exactly. or the us and the source. There's more mass. And so that that actually matches the pattern and makes sense. You know? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Instead of just it's moving faster. You know. Exactly. So there's and, there's more mass between us and the source. So that is more matter to affect the light. And we, we know that matter affects light. It bends light and it redshifts it. So that's the simple argument. That's the simple argument. And so you can actually show it with math, right? Using just the simple redshift mm -hmm. formula. Um, can you show that now, basically, uh, how yeah, it would... I don't know how calculate. convincing it would be for, for people that are unfamiliar, but it maybe it will make them think about it if they are very familiar, you know, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, we can walk through that. Okay. So this is just the gravitational redshift equation. Um, this number here, this 3.5, it's what I've decided is what would be the minimum threshold of, uh, the gravitational acceleration for the observable universe, but that's getting too complicated. Really. If you just look at it, we could just do just two GM divided by RC squared. That is the gravitational redshift equation. So that's the formula, right? Can you say that again, the, the actual formula? The actual formula is two times the gravitational constant times the mass divided by the radius times the speed of light squared. Now that equals a dimensionless unit. So that would be like the factor of change. And now this is like, a, again, this is a simplified version of the gravitational redshift equation. You can get as complicated as you want to get, but... That's what that's all we're doing is just kind of a back of the envelope calculation, right? Here. Show it's in the order of magnitude. I just want to show that it's possible if you use the mass of the universe to get the Hubble values. Right. And so what I was saying, the two GMR squared, that's that's what this is. This uh three point five times ten to the next, this just includes the mass and the radius. This is just basic working like you the the uh gravitational acceleration, you can work backwards from that and find the mass and the, the radius of that object. But just for uh, demonstration purposes, this is just the dimensionless. This will be the factor of change for this uh, an object with this amount of mass for the C squared. If you interpret that as the Doppler effect, then it would be this 70, like now we have a, a, a velocity. And so it's 72,000 meters per second. And that's what we see for the Hubble constant, approximately. Mm -hmm. And again, they can't get an accurate measurement of the Hubble constant. If you're, what you're proposing as, as a theory is true, then that would, in my mind, it seems to make sense because you're going to have different density. You're going to have different blue shift effects. You could have different density, slight different densities when you look different directions. Yeah, I mean, the universe is not homogenous. This is something I've... I despise that term homogenous. Like the, the cosmologists has have always said the universe is homogenous, the universe is homogenous, but it's obviously not homogenous. Like if it was if the universe is homogenous, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I guess they um, say on a large scale, that's how on, they get around the, it. Like homogenous on the largest on a large scale. scale. Right. But which means on smaller scales, it's what? It's more massive or less massive? Definitely more massive. Well, like a higher density, I guess that's the right higher word. density. And but so less massive, you say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why this uniform gravitational acceleration works out. It's because the mass density is inversely proportional to the radius of, of the whatever object you're talking about. So, right, that, so that means at the smallest scales, you're going to have the highest density, right? Atoms are super dense. And then you're going to exactly. go out to, you know, planets are less dense, stars. And then you go to galaxies are going to be less Not, dense yeah. than stars, essentially, yeah. out to super clusters, et cetera. Exactly. And so... You can go out to the observable radius, which for me, for for this value is around 4150. And so that's the speed of light. I mean, it's 4153 would be. So 4153 megaparsecs. It's, so it's three light years per parsec. So that comes out to 13.7 billion light years is, is what you just typed in there. 4153 megaparsecs. Yeah, that's around, around 13.7 billion light years. That would be the observable radius. So basically, you took the observable radius of the universe, you plugged it into that equation, and that gave you the actual speed of light as the yeah. as the value of the redshift. Is that what I understand? Yes. And so that um, that's why we can't see past that distance, right? 
because right. it's actually been redshifted out of our view. And that because that you just calculated just by plugging in again the radius of the of the observable universe, um, the basic mass of the universe through that through that density term, and you came out with the speed of light. Exactly. So uh, that's where we have a redshift wall essentially. We can't see past that distance because it's been is. redshifted out of our vision. I think the technical term for it, instead of observable radius, now that's fine for communication purposes, but the technical term for it would actually be the Schwarzschild radius. The Schwarzschild so, radius. And if you consider an object with the Schwarzschild radius, if you consider that a black hole, then it would be, you know, the universe would be a black hole, but it's not a black hole. It's just that there's no, it's kind of a black hole. It's similar. It's very similar. You know, it's, it's got an observable limit. And so from this, in this model, um, if it is a black hole, then the, the CMBR, the cosmic microwave background radiation you've calculated could be a uh, Hawking radiation. Is that correct? I mean, yeah. Or as a theory, as a speculative theory. Yeah. That's my speculation. Yeah. There is a, a simple equation for Hawking radiation that just includes the radius and the mass. And if you plug that in for the observable radius, it's, it's like it, way too low. It's like 1E negative 30. Kelvin. Hmm. But there is a corresponding blue shift because this is not a star that's admitting it. This is basically empty space. Hawking radiation is just manifesting from beyond the radius, you can say. And so that would be that would undergo a blue shift, which is the opposite. And so, so that would make up the difference. Yeah, that's all that's all the speculative stuff, but I'm able to predict 6 Kelvin, which is off by a factor of two, you know. So using your formulas, you got six Kelvin instead of two point seven. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. Like I'm using the maximum factor of change because that would be the max. Like the observable universe is the most amount of mass you could ever have, so that'd be the maximum Amazing. factor of change. And that that right there gets you really close to the two point seven. Yeah. That's really close. I was, I was very surprised. Yeah, using that, you got to six Kelvin. Yeah, and like that. <laughs> I don't know the, the the equation I came up with is not like there's no equation for this. I, actually, Claude come up with it. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the AI Claude, yeah. but yes, like yes, Claude.ai. Yep. Yeah, so I have to give him credit. Like I, I ask him, yep. like, specifically come up with an equation that gives me the maximum factor of change. Now it was, took a long time to get to that equation. Like most of them were stupid, but. He yep. did end up coming up with that. And I was like, that's, that's actually, that that's reasonable. I like this. Yeah. So basically just to sum it up, you, you know, the basics of your argument is that all this, the redshift that we're seeing is not from expanding space. The other option, which was at the beginning, actually, when they first came out in the twenties is basically a tired light option where the light as it's traveling, the volume of space that can affect it, the volume of matter that can affect it keeps expanding. And that is what causes the actual redshift. So all we're seeing, there's no cosmological redshift. All there is is gravitational redshift. And you showed through that formula that there's enough matter. And just using our basic formulas that we have now, there's enough matter to calculate out and get the current Hubble yeah. constant that we're seeing, which would be the amount of redshift. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. And it just so happens that it's really close to Milgram's work with modified Newtonian dynamics, he theorized that there's a minimum threshold for a gravitational acceleration. Never really could come up with why. I don't I don't know why. Like it seems to me like it's obvious. It's the observable universe, you know, is yeah. the minimum. Like that's any particle within a cloud can't have a lower gravitational acceleration than the cloud as a whole. So and that's that's the gist of it, you know. Like there's there's gravity everywhere. It basically is is what it will. It has no to. distance limit. There's no distance right. limit to to gravity, or maybe it is. Maybe it's based well, see, on it's the hard light to, radius. You can say that just because like you're including the entire universe, and like you yep. know this now that we've done the calculations and all all of that. But it's not necessarily the the appropriate way to say it because if the universe had less mass, then it it might be different. The observable radius would be larger, but you could you could distribute the mass in a different way. If you're in the center of a galaxy and I'm shining, I'm on the outside of the galaxy shining a lot to you, it's going to be blue shifted. 
because the densities are different, right? I mean, right, you're really right. looking at these different be. densities of matter right, inside that would those be volume be. spaces. Right. That's an asymmetrical kind of observation. You know, it's not what I'm doing. Like what I'm doing is on, on a, a larger scale, a cosmological scale. You know, in other words, you don't have to change any kind of physical laws. It's just you just use general relativity. <laughs> yeah. Just go back. Use use the other option, which is yeah. not Doppler. So we're not talking about motion. We're just talking about right. yeah. gravitational just redshift. We're just talking redshift. The Friedman, the, the Friedman equation away, throw the FLRW away and use the Schwarzschild metric. If you're a cosmologist out there and you think I'm full of it, that's what I'm suggesting you do. And when you do that and you like the that mass density that I've described, the inverse relationship, if you do that, then you can smoothly match the interior solution of the Schwarzschild metric to the exterior solution. And that happens at the Schwarzschild radius. So that's, to Excellent. me, that's fairly significant mathematically. So that's that's on your website, if I remember right. The universe is yes. not expanding.com. Yes, exactly. Okay, excellent. So thanks everyone for watching. If you did watch, I hope it, it made you think and, and realize there are other options out there. And this is a simple, very powerful model, I think. And again, Einstein, he thought of it uh, it was his initial idea was actually that light is, a, is just affected by gravity. And that idea was just kind of tossed away. The tired light idea, they basically say it, it has to be blurry. But as we showed here, it's not blurry. Right? We're looking at stars. We're looking at galaxies. We know they're, we, we use their gravitational redshift already and they're, they're clear, right? So gravitational redshift isn't blurry, no, it looks no like. Distortion. I mean, there's a little bit of a distortion, but that's gravitational lensing. It's a completely different subject. Well, it's, it bends light. So that's really, it's getting bent. Yeah. The light is getting bent by matter, which is just yeah. another angle, I think, of this. Exactly. Well, excellent. Thanks, everyone, uh, for watching. Please, uh, if you did like this, remember to smash the like button. That, that really does help. And then you can uh, subscribe to get future notifications. If you want to support the channel, along with these fine people, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. And uh, thanks to you, Chris, uh, for being on the show. Thank you so much.